I'm uh, honored to be with you today for your questions from one of the finest universities in the world. Tours to be told, I never graduated from college. This is the closest I've ever gotten to the college graduation. Today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it, no big deal. Just three stories. My first story is about connecting the dots. I dropped at Reed College after the first six months, but then I stayed around as a, as a drop in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So, why did I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young and well graduate student, and she decided to put me for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by uh, college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at first by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out at the last minute that they really wanted a girl, my parents, who were on a wedding list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy, do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from a college and that my father had never graduated from a high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the third in my life. 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Sanford, and all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. Um, I had no idea and uh, Six months later, um, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents saved their entire life. So I decided to still, so I decided to quit. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, um, the minute I dropped out, uh, uh, I could stop taking required classes that didn't interest me, and uh, dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. Uh, I didn't have dorm rooms, so I slept. Um, I didn't have dorm room, so I slept, so I slept on the floor in friends' room. I returned Coke bottles for the five cent about to buy food with. And I would walk to several miles across town every Sunday night a week uh, to, get, to get one good meal a week at the Harry Christian Temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into turned out to be process later on. Let me give you an example. Reed College at the time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every level, every, every door, was beautifully hand calligraphed. Um, because I dropped out, uh, I didn't have to take the normal classes. So um, I began to take uh, I begin to take the uh, calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about selfie and some self type faces, about bearing about 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 bearing them at space different letter, about bearing them at space between different letter combinations about what makes right typography right. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that sand can capture. And I found it fascinating. None of this had even hope any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. Um, we uh, so we designed it all into the Mac. Um, this is the first computer with beautiful typography. Uh, if I had never dropped in on the single course in college, um, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spent fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I have never dropped in on the, if I have never dropped out, I would never dropped in on the calligraphy class to learn how to do this. And. Uh, um, the Mac might not have the one full typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college. But looking back, uh, uh, it was very, very clear looking backwards. 
but 10 years later, um, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward when I was in college. You, of course, uh, again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust the dots will uh, connect in your future. You have to trust in something. Your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Believing the dots will connect down the road. Will give you the confidence to follow your heart. Um, uh, even when it leads you off the well worn path. And that will make all the difference. My second story is about love and loss. I was lucky. I found what I love to do early in life. Was then I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard. Uh, 10 years later, Apple grew up from just a service in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We had just released the market. We had, we had, we just released the first creation at Macintosh a year earlier and then I just and then I just turned 30 and then I got fired how can you get fired from a company you started well we hired well uh, as Apple grew we hired someone who I thought was very talented to run the company with me uh, for the first year or so things went well but then our vision of the future began to diverge and uh, we had falling out um, when we did, our board of directors sat with him. So at 30, I was out, very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone. I'd been rejected. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. It was devastating. Uh, I felt that I let the previous generations of entrepreneurs down. And uh, I dropped the baton as it was being past me. I met with David Packard and Bob Noyce uh, uh, and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. Um, I was very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to down on me. I still loved what I did. Um, I'd been re uh, the talent event at Apple has not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. Uh, so I started over. Um, uh, I didn't see it then, um, but it turned out to be getting fed up from Apple was the best thing that ever happened to me. Heaviness of being successful was repressed by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me the end of one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named The Next, another company named Pixar, and I fell in love with an amazing woman who became my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story, and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable talent event, Apple bought Next, and the, develop, and the technology we developed at the Next is at the heart of the Apple's talent renaissance. And Lorraine and I have a wonderful family together. Um, I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if it hadn't been from. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if it hadn't been getting from Apple. Um, it was all for testing medicine, um, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometimes that's gonna hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose face. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. Um, this is as true for your work as it is for your work lovers. Your life, uh, your work is going to feel a large part of your life. Uh, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you believe is great, uh, is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. Um, as with all matters of heart, like any great relationship, it, like any great relationship, um, like any great relationship, uh, it's like it's like it's just like getting it's like just it's just like um, uh, it's just like getting better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. My third story is about death. Uh, when I was seventeen. 
um, a red quote that went something like If you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. It made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? Whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Uh, remembering that I'll be destined is the most important tool I ever encountered to I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices. Because almost everything, our external expectations, our pride, our fear of embarrassment and failure, these things just fall away in a facing death. Remembering that you're going to die um, is the best way I know to avoid to avoid the trouble to avoid the trouble of thinking. Um, Living only what is truly really important. Uh, you are already naked. Uh, uh, there's no reason not to follow your heart. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan seven. I had a scan seven thirty in the morning. Um, um, and it clearly, and it very, and it, and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. Um, the doctor told me um, and that is um, that is almost our, that is as all, that is as almost certain that is as almost that is as almost our, that is almost our, that is almost a certain type of cancer that is incurable. Uh, and that I should expect to that I, that I should expect expect that I should that I should expect to, that I should expect and that I should expect and that I should expect, that I should expect and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. And my doctor advised me to go home and get my fear, uh, which the doctor has called for prepare to die. Um, it means, um, uh, it means to try and dedicate everything. You thought you have the next 10 years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is and up um, and that will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say goodbye. Um, um, let, uh, I live with the diagnosis all day. Later that evening, uh, I had a biopsy. When they stuck my endoscope down my throat, threw my stomach into my intestines, got a few cells from the tumor on my pancreas. I was sedated, but my wife, who was there, told me that when they view an, under microscope, my uh, the doctor started crying and because it turned out to be very very real form of pancreatic cancer that is treatable with surgery i had a surgery and thankfully i'm fine now mm. um, this is the close i've been to facing this and uh, and i hope it's the close i got for a few more decades having lived through it i can now say this to you with a bit more certain than when this uh, was a useful but purely intellectual concept no one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. And, uh, and, and no, one can, no one has ever escaped it. And no one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be. Because death is likely the single best invention of life. It's a life change agent. It clears out the old to, it clears out, it clears out the old to make for the new. And right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you are gradually, you are gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste living in someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others, don't let the noise of, uh, uh, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. They somehow already know uh, everything else is secondary. And the most important thing, um, have the courage to follow your heart. Uh, they somehow already know um, uh, everything else is secondary. When I was young, um, 
When I was young, there's an amazing publication called the Horace Catalog, which is one of the Bibles of my generation. It's made an, uh, it was created by Stuart Brand. It, it was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park. Um, 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 it's made an impression. Um, um, he brought it. He brought it to life with his poetic, um, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. Um, um, this was in the late sixties, before personal computers and desktop desktop publishing. So automated with typewriters, scissors, and powerful cameras. And uh, um, it was sort of like Google. It was sort of like. It's sort of like Google. It was. It's sort of like Google's paperback form, 35 years before Google came along. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle, in a way that sand can't capture. Um, and I found it fascinating. And uh, and uh, I swore and it came out several issues of the Horace catalog. And then when it was Ryan's course, they put out a final issue. This was in uh, this was uh, this was in the 1970s. I was your age when I was your age. On the back cover of the final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, uh, like you might find yourself hitchh hitchhiking on if you are so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, "Stay hungry, stay foolish." It was the farewell message as it signed off. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And I always wish that for myself. Right now, you graduate to begin anew. I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all, thank you all very much.